right, amazing, cool. Hey, well, great to have you all in a room together and um, yeah, patched in from, um, I'd say around the world, but we're in Portugal, we're UK, and then we're, where are you, Jerome? The Netherlands. The Netherlands, yes, great, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, Chris, yeah, perhaps, perhaps a moment just to dive in and tell everybody who's listening a little bit about Sea Shepherd as a whole. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us, Lawrence. Um, big fan of Finisterre, uh, what you guys are doing with Tom and, and the gang. And this is an awesome, very relevant event. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for having us. Uh, so yeah, Sea Shepherd was founded in the 1970s by Captain Paul Watson, one of the original founders of Greenpeace, and decided that he wanted to take more direct action, saving the whales and saving general marine life in general. So he founded and started Sea Shepherd. And this was um, the first campaigns were in the, the, the Antarctic, um, saving, the, saving the whales that were getting you know, killed left, right and centre. And then throughout the years, Sea Shepherd has been stopping the needless killing of marine wildlife all over the world. Um, as I say, initially in, in Antarctica with the, with the whales and then onto seals. And then, you know, fast forward, we were made famous by Whale Wars uh, on Animal Channel, uh, which is very much documenting what, documenting what we're doing with, the, with saving the whales. And then now, currently, our most popular campaigns, or our most relevant campaigns, which is all of them, of course, but uh, the IUU campaign, which is the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fish in West Africa. Yeah, and we're literally, you know, in many places over the world, in the Gulf of Mexico, in France, in the UK, um, in West Africa, as I just mentioned. And that's what we've been doing for over 40 years now, is, is stopping the needless killing of marine wildlife and, con and conservation work, ultimately. Um, and then regarding nets, it's something that we do indirectly or directly. Different campaigns uh, are based on nets. But generally, there's such a, a killer of marine wildlife that you know, on every campaign, we're always collecting nets. Very fortunate over the years as well to acquire uh, a lot of vessels, which then we have uh, the equipment to to bring in these nets out at sea. You mentioned nets there. This is what you you'll often refer to as ghost nets, or um, and it's the the byproduct of quite a lot of the time quite a lot of the time uh, illegal fishing operations and this this marine debris that entangles marine wildlife and. Um, and you mentioned, I think we wanted to talk about Operation Milagro, which is over in the, the Gulf, of, Gulf of California. That's right, yeah, in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, so this is one of our far, far, far flung, uh, far away activities. Uh, Operation Milagro uh, is very relevant. Uh, basically, it's to stop the needless killing and the, the destruction of the habitat of the Fakita porpoise, which is a beautiful, small, uh, looking dolphin, very cute little uh, species. Uh, what's happening there is basically they're getting wiped out. Uh, I think there's, there's probably less than 15 left in the world. And initially it was around 20, but unfortunately they're constantly getting killed. This is due to local fishermen working with the cartel, trying to catch the Tatawaba fish, uh, which is sought after for its bladder, which sells for high values in, in, the, in the markets, in the black markets. And basically fishermen are going out putting huge gill nets and huge different types of nets to catch the Tatawaba and in return killing the Fakita but also killing you know, whales, dolphins, sharks and every kind of uh, marine life that there is. We've become quite experts uh, in the Sea of Cortez at actually collecting nets and that's the whole campaign is literally fishermen go out, put the nets and we go out and take the nets back up. And we've caught over... You know, thousands of nets over this since this campaign's, campaign's been going on for the last two three years um yeah and that's the most uh, one of the higher kind of um targets there is just basically collecting nets on this campaign but we also have you know in um, in italy and france and, and other countries as well um concentrating on collecting nets and, you, and then you, you just mentioned back across into i guess waters closer to home and um, hop across to yourself, Tony, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit and, um, and perhaps distill some of what Sea Shepherd UK do. Yeah, I'm Tony Land, I'm a volunteer and the GhostNet coordinator. Um, we've got several campaigns in the UK. We've got the GhostNet one, we do the Faroe Islands, 
and we also do the Icelandic campaign. Apart from even still, you know, this stuff going on in Scotland. But I run the whole of the GhostNet campaign. Um, pretty much like Chris said, you know, I mean, in the UK, it's the second largest source of marine debris. And this is lost and discarded nets, pots, you know, boys, ropes, all these sort of things which are entanglements for other species. Um, you know, we, we've also got massive problems with dumping, which was quite prevalent. You know, what people didn't want to do was recycle the net themselves. So they dump it on a wreck, knowing full well they wouldn't fish that wreck. Things have kind of changed around Cornwall now because these different initiatives set up that will then give them a, a point to recycle from because there's only two places in the whole of Europe that recycle nets. Um, so, you know, it has to go in a container, go over to Slovakia or go over to Denmark to be recycled. So the whole thing is, you know, it really is a massive problem and it's a global problem. You know, it's not just UK waters, it's not just Mediterranean waters or European waters, it's a worldwide problem. And you, meant, you mentioned when we spoke a little bit earlier about how this is kind of in its infancy over here in the UK, the, the, the issue of ghost net retrieval. And um, you mentioned yourself, you, this isn't your full time job that, you know, you're, a, you're, you're one of the hardened volunteers who, um, who, who does this in, in your spare time as well. And, you know, how, how hard is it getting something like this going over here? Um, it's, it's just time consuming. You know, it's, it's pretty tricky. What we, we're trying to do within the UK and with Europe is work with other guys who are lifting gear. So if I get an email coming through to me saying, you know, there's something in the North Sea and I know that another group can go and pick that up, I'll let them know straight away. Or if there's stuff on the South Coast where you are, I can let Fathoms, Fathoms Free know. They'll go down. We have volunteers who work with them. So it's all about collaborating, because if you don't work as a team, we're not going to achieve anything at all. You know, we, we need high impact, and because there's only so many groups who are actually lifting gear, you know, we need to work as one unit. And the other thing is, we're getting loads of nets reported that have been washed ashore. So again, I send out emails left, right and centre, can anybody go and pick it up? You know, whether it's Sea Shepherd UK guys or guys in South Wales who we work with or Pembroke, should I say, and the guys on the South Coast. You know, because once it's cleared from the beaches, that's great. If it gets washed back out again, that then takes all our resources to go and pick it up when it's easy to pick it up from a beach. You know, we, we've got probably 20 divers in the UK, um, four boats, you know, so we can get to the gear, but you then got to pinpoint where the gear is. So like I say, it's easier if you can clear it from the beach and save your resources for, you know, diving on wrecks and one thing and another. Um, might, might sound like an a, a silly question to ask, but how, how do we stop, how do we stop these things ending up discarded and, you know, causing a nuisance and, you know, how, how do we cut the middleman out and stop the, um, stop these nets being an issue in the in the first place i mean none of the fishermen go about to lose their nets it's not what they want to do you know or they don't want to lose the pots they are losing money you know if a lobster pot say 70 pound and there's 10 on a string you, you lost 700 quid so a lot of it's not intentional you know some of the stuff gets snagged or it might be set poorly you know, they set it too close to a reef because all the lobster pots and crab pots are all predominantly on, on like ridges and shelves, you know, because the, the crustaceans live within those areas. Um, something that has been talked about in the past is if nets and pots can be marked, if there's some sort of an identification, you know, if we work down those that, that sort of route, if something could be identified to a specific trawler or a specific boat, 
you know, perhaps they would recover them themselves if they would, if they were fined at the end of it. Yeah, to hop hop over to your, yourself, um, uh, Jerome, um, if you wanted to introduce what you do over in um, in the Netherlands and um, perhaps how long you've been with a part of Sea Shepherd. Sure. Um, um, I'm uh, based in the Netherlands here near the head office, which is actually in Amsterdam. This is a satellite office. Uh, been around uh, seven years now um, with Sea Shepherd. Um, first started uh, launching the Amsterdam brick and mortar store and then made my way up to uh, being the, the global merge director, which is what I'm currently doing um, and also work on a lot of partnerships. Um, now for Sea Shepherd, uh, merchandise has been um, very valuable for, for, for decades, basically. I mean, I think we recognize with our logo that you know, it really brings people together. They want to be part of that Neptune's Navy, if you want to call it that. Um, and so we're using it for outreach. We're creating, you know, many ambassadors that want to, you know, you know be vocal about what we do. Um, and of course, you know, it's a, it's a very important fundraising pillar to Sea Shepherd. But, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, we also recognized that, you know, there's so much more that we can do with just with merchandising. And we also need to be very conscious about, you know, about how sustainable that is. So this is something that we're, we're you know, we're asking ourselves over and over. And uh, especially with partnerships, you know, with, for instance, Adidas, uh, we did one with, well, with, with G-Star some time ago, creating, you know, or helping creating a bionic yarn, using uh, recycled nets, recycled um, plastics from the ocean, and, you know, and put them back into the supply chain. I think this is, a very important development. So we're trying to be a front runner in that respect. Um, and together with, with other organizations, um, you know, profit or, or non-profit, uh, make steps, uh, you know, not only in, uh, in ocean conservation, but also in creating sustainable business. So that's what I'm, what, which I'm very much part of. And um, so on the one hand, we're trying to, um, you know, get, you know, you know, give biotech a chance, you know, creating, using new fibers for apparel, et cetera, to, to stay away from, you know, a, a big polluter like uh, regular cotton. And on the other hand, we're, we're looking at synthetics. And, and that's where you come, you know, where you uh, quickly uh, find a connection with ocean nets, because this could be um, a raw material of the future. Now, it's very hard to use and to, uh, to make it work for, um, uh, for recycling, I have to say. Um, I, I guess a couple of years back, I thought, well, you know, how hard can it be? But, uh, uh, you know, by doing some research and, and discovering how many different types of plastics there are actually used to, you know, for, for, um, for all types of fishing gear, you know, so not only the nets, but also the long lines and, you know, the fish aggravating devices, you know, there's like millions of those in the middle Mediterranean. They all have a different composition, but they're all, they're all worth something. We just have to find a way to make that work. And, um, and together with Chris and also other guys from, from the, um, from the C C C with organization, uh, we're trying to see how we can make the supply chain work. Just listen to you all, all three of you speak. There's a real theme that runs throughout, and it's that partnership thing. You've you've all mentioned it in some capacity there. You know, from you know working with local fishermen over in you know, the Gulf of California and incentivizing some you know way of retrieving that ghost net to working with divers and those on kind of home shores around the UK to go out and retrieve. It's and then what you said there, a partnership in kind of uh, innovation and design and tech and um, it's uh, yeah yeah really really apparent that the um, you know, the power of many better than you guys just being out there on your own it's um, yeah, yeah incredible we have a big name but we're like a tiny tiny organization really you know and we're super dependent of partners and volunteers to actually make it work and the only way that you can do that is by doing it together there's no room for egos how does someone learning about Sea Shepherd for the first time um, do more? I mean, if, if any divers want to join the GhostNet campaign, um, all they need to do is email me at ghostnet at seashepherduk.org. Um, they need to be a minimum of advanced open water and have done at least 100 UK dives. 
Um, so they can always get in touch with me that way. And I think if everybody, or, or like Jerome said, people are becoming aware now after Sea Spiracy. So if everybody's walking down a beach, walking down a canal or a riverside, pick something up. You know, always take a bag out with you. And, you know, it's, it's all going to make some sort of an impact. We need to get the whole general public you know, on side. You know, don't leave anything on a beach. I mean, people do. You know, they'll all be on the coast this weekend and they'll walk away from everything that they've taken to the beach. And ultimately, that just gets washed straight into the water. Then for international, you know, wherever you're from, sign up to your local chapter. Um, sea Shepherd UK are based all over the UK. Uh, I'm based in Portugal, uh, so I'm a voluntary director of Sea Shepherd Portugal. Um, I actually volunteered many years ago to, to help this chapter uh, kind of grow. Uh, and then I met Jerome. I also work with innovation. So everyone can contribute in whatever talent or not talent, whatever you know, skill they have. Uh, even if it's simply going to do beach cleanups and joining the local chapter for beach cleanups. But if you have a specific skill, we're always looking for captains, bosuns, engineers, um, and you can volunteer for our onboarding uh, crew, so out at sea, but also on land. So every bit helps. Um, yeah, that's that. And also partnerships as well. So I work with Jerome on partnerships. And, you know, people think, oh, we have to be a big corporate or whatever to partnership with, with the Sea Shepherd. But not at all. Uh, there's many different um, kind of uh, partnerships that we can do from small companies, startups, scale-ups to SMEs to, to corporates. And just depends what they do. There's, there's room for everybody. And it's not just about uh, donations and, and partnershiping uh, with us to, to receive donations. It's also about helping us spread our brand and create awareness and, and show the world, you know, that every little bit helps, whether it's just picking up litter or speaking to your family about you know, great documentaries like sea, uh, sea Spiracy or Sea Shepherd and just making people aware is, is super valuable. So, um, you know, guys and girls who work for Sea, she for sea Shepherd are, you know, incredibly, um, you said, skillful and passionate about what you do. And it's, um, the, yeah, it's, uh, you know, now more than ever we need that. So it's, yeah, you know, credit to, credit to each other, every one of you who, um, you know, does this in your own time as well. And, and whilst of juggling other jobs and it's, um, yeah, yeah, pleasure to be, talking to you and uh, yeah, see where these partnerships take us.